I want to do an example so you can clearly see the recording process. All the journal entries required to record a non-strategic investment, passive investment, using fair value through profit or loss. I'm going to switch to Excel to make it easier to view. As always, let's start by reading the question. Helen Corp purchases for cash 10,000 common shares for $18 per share on the open market. They purchased the shares on February 18, 2028. The company has a December 31st year end. When I'm saying the company, we mean Helen Corp. The company they purchased the shares from, XDD Inc., has 1 million shares outstanding. Management's intention is to hold the shares for two to three years and then sell them as cash is needed. And then you've got a bunch of information with regards to 2028, 29, and 2030. Provide all the entries to record this investment from 2028 to 2030. First, of course, we have to determine whether this is a strategic investment or a non-strategic investment. We can see that the share ownership is actually only 1%, 10,000 divided by a million. So there is no indicators of any kind of control. That means that this is a non-strategic investment, and we only have two choices on how to record it, which is fair value through profit and loss or fair value through OCI. Now, we can see that management never made an irrevocable election, and therefore we have to use fair value through profit and loss. I want to quickly highlight one of the issues that happens when students are actually solving a question like this. They can see 2028, 29, and 30. And so they start looking ahead and adjusting their entries for 2028, for instance, because they see something in 2029. I want to make sure you understand when we're looking at each of these pieces of information, we have to pretend that the future information is not available. So when I look at the information for February 18th, 2028, pretend that all the future information that you've received in a question is invisible. We're standing in the date of the transaction and we cannot see or predict into the future. Let's get started making the entries. On the 18th of February, 2028, we purchased 10,000 shares at $18 per share. That is the acquisition cost, the fair value at acquisition. So we're going to do an entry. What did we get? We got an investment, which is an asset. So that's a debit to an investment account, equity investment, fair value through profit or loss. Now, notice that I use the actual fair value through profit and loss in the equity account name. You don't have to do that. I do that for demonstration purposes and also for clarity because I find students when they're doing the entries, they suddenly get confused. So putting the method of recording the equity investment in the actual title of the account is helpful for students to keep them focused on which method we're using. We gave away cash, so that's a credit to cash, and that is $180,000, which is 10,000 shares multiplied by the 18. We're going to put it into our equity account as a debit to the equity account. On the 31st of December, 2028, which is our reporting period, we see that the fair value of the shares has declined to $15. We have to make our fair value adjustment because it's a period end, a reporting period. So we're going to make that adjustment right now. So you can see that this is an unrealized loss. How did we calculate it? We took the $15, subtracted the $18. So that's the difference between the original price and the current fair value. And we're gonna multiply it by the 10,000 shares we own, which is a change in value of $30,000. This is a debit to an unrealized loss on equity investment, $30,000. We're going to write down the investment through the profit and loss statement, also called the income statement. We're gonna also credit the equity investment, fair value through P&L, by the $30,000 write down. You'll notice that at December 31st, 2028, we're going to report on our statement of financial position as a non-current asset, because remember, management intends to hold it for two to three years. So we're going to recognize it as a non-current asset, $150,000. Now, on the 2nd of June, 2029, the dividend is declared by XDD Inc. It's $550,000 for 
all shareholders. Remember, there is a million shares outstanding. We have a right to only 1% of this dividend. Because the dividend has been declared and we believe that it is probable that we'll receive it, we have to recognize it on the date of declaration. So on the 2nd of June, 2029, we're going to do a debit to dividends receivable because we have a legal right to receive them in the future. That $550,000 multiplied by 1% is $5,500. We're going to credit dividend income, also called dividend revenue, on the income statement, $5,500. Notice that our equity investments, the value does not change. On July 1st, 2029, we actually received the cash from the company. The cash paid out by the company is the full 550,000. We received 5,500 of that. So that's going to be a debit to cash because it's been received, 5,500, and a credit to the dividend receivable to reduce the dividend receivable down to zero. Again, notice that the equity account is not changed at all. On December 31st, 2029, we now have another fair value adjustment. The fair value of the shares is now $22 per share. Remember, our last fair value adjustment changed the value on the statement of financial position to $15. So right now we have an unrealized gain. The difference between the $22 fair value right now and the $15 carrying value that's on our statement of financial position. So $22 minus $15 multiplied by the 10,000 shares is equal to a $70,000 unrealized gain. We're going to debit the investment by $70,000 to increase the investment to its appropriate value, $220,000. Keep in mind that $220,000 is the $22 multiplied by the 10,000 shares. We're also going to credit the unrealized gain on equity investment, which is a P&L account on the income statement, $70,000. Now, when we report, we're going to put the $220,000 on the statement of financial position as a non-current asset. Why? Because we still believe, management still believes, that they're going to hold these shares for longer than one year. Keep in mind that the classification of either current or non-current is based on management's intention with regards to the shares. There's no indication that they're going to sell the shares in the upcoming year, so therefore we keep it as non-current. Now, on April 18th, 2030, we sell 6,000 shares. Keep in mind that at December 31st, 2029, we had it as a non-current asset because at that time, we believed that we weren't going to sell the shares. And so that is still correct. It's correct because our belief at that time was, I'm not going to sell the shares. The fact that we now have sold the shares doesn't make any difference at all. That's a decision that we're making right now based on the share price. The decision to make it non-current was based on the December 31st, 2029 intention of not selling it. So we're now going to sell it. We have to do a debit to cash because we've received cash. How much did we receive? We received the $24 multiplied by the 6,000 shares, which is $144,000. We have to credit the investment, but we have to credit the investment for the carrying value. The carrying value was the $22 that we valued it at at the end of last year. So we're going to take the $22, multiply it by the $6,000. And so there's a reduction to the equity account, a credit to the equity investment, fair value through profit or loss, $132,000. In addition, we now have a gain on the sale of the investment. Notice that this is a realized gain. That's why we're calling it gain on sale of investment. This is the difference between the carrying value, $22, and the sale value, $24, multiplied by the 6,000 shares, which is $12,000. That's going to show up on our income statement, statement of profit or loss, as $12,000 gain. Notice that the ending value in our account on the 18th of April, 2030 is $88,000. That's 4,000 shares multiplied by the carrying value of $22. On December 31st, 2030, we have another fair value adjustment. The fair value is now $21. So what's gonna happen? There's been a reduction in the value of our shares from the carrying value of $22 to the current fair value of $21. Notice that that $24 value at the 
point of sale, we totally ignore that because the carrying value on our statement is $88,000, which recognizes 4,000 multiplied by 22. So the fair value adjustment is going to be the $21 minus the $22, all multiplied by 4,000, which is $4,000 adjustment. I'm going to debit the unrealized loss on equity investment, $4,000, and I'm going to credit the equity investment fair value through profit or loss, $4,000. That means at December 31st, 2030, I'm going to report my investment as $84,000 on the statement of financial position. Whether it's current or non-current is dependent on management's intention with regards to the remaining 4,000 shares. If management intends to keep it longer than a year, it will be recorded as a non-current asset. But if they plan to sell these 4,000 shares within the upcoming year, they have to classify it as a current asset. Here are all the entries we just completed without the explanations. You can see that the ending value on the statement of financial position is $84,000. Now, one thing we didn't deal with in this example is what happens if there's transaction fees from purchasing and selling shares, which is extremely common. Let's look at this example with just the addition of transaction fees when the shares are purchased and when the shares are sold. Assume that on February 18th, 2028, we still purchased 10,000 shares at $18 per share, but there was a transaction fee of 10 cents per share. How do we record this? You can see the original entry that we already made when there was no transaction fees. How do we record the transaction fees? What happens is we have to recognize the investment still at 10,000 multiplied by the $18, which is $180,000. So we still have a debit to the equity investment, fair value through profit or loss. But we also have to recognize the brokerage fees. So there's going to be a debit to brokerage fees, expense or brokerage expense or administrative expense, whatever we want to call it, for $1,000, which is, of course, the 10,000 shares multiplied by 10 cents each. We're then going to credit cash for $181,000, which is the cost of purchasing these shares. Notice the difference between when there is no transaction fee and when there is a transaction fee. We can see that cash is still the same account. However, the amount is different because the cash has had to increase by the amount of the brokerage fee. Regardless of whether there's a transaction fee or no transaction fee, the value of the equity investment at the date of purchase is identical. The only thing that has been added is the fact that we now have an expense account for the amount of the brokerage fee, and we also have an increase to the cash. Now, what if there was a transaction fee when we sold the shares? We can see here that on April 18th, 2030, we still sold the shares 6,000 for $24, but now there's a 15 cent per share transaction fee. The original entry had a debit to cash, a credit to the gain on sale of equity investment, and a credit to the equity investment, fair value through profit or loss. However, when we have a transaction fee, we can see that we've got a debit to the brokerage expense. $900, which is the 6,000 shares multiplied by the 15 cents. We have a debit to cash, but the debit to cash is no longer the $144,000. It's the $144,000 less the brokerage fee that our broker would have held back when they transferred us the cash from the sale. So the broker would actually keep their transaction fee and give us less money, which is why there's a debit to cash of $143,100. Notice that our credit to the gain is identical, $12,000, and our credit to the equity investment is $132,000. There's been no change to the gain amount, 12,000, no change to the equity investment of 132,000. The only change that we can see right now is the fact that cash has been reduced from $144,000 to 143,100, the selling price of the shares minus whatever fees we had to pay. And we also have a new account, brokerage expense, $900. We can quickly see that the change to the equity investment account is still a credit of $132,000, regardless of whether we had a transaction fee or no transaction fee.
Therefore, if we have transaction fees, you'll notice that there's only two changes. There's a change to the acquisition entry and there's a change to any entry to sell the investment. However, at the end of the period, the value in the equity account, regardless of whether there's transaction fees or no transaction fees, is identical. In this case, $84,000. Those are the entries for fair value through P&L, taking into account either no transaction fees or transaction fees.